Oh yes, welcome to All Night Northernics R Norway in Neon. And I am your host, Joe Orengo. I am the co-organizer of All Night Northern XR and the CEO of XR Nation. And um, I don't know if you can see my background, but I'm live from Palm Springs working on my tan. As you can see, it's going lovely. I want to thank you all for joining us live and also watching the recording at home or wherever you are. And um, I just want to tell you a bit about AWE. And that is the world's number one event series for the XR industry. And All Night Northern XR is one of many all night meetups all over the world. And we're very happy that we are able to cover quite a vast area from Iceland all the way to Estonia and everything in between. And I want to thank our, our sponsors for this evening's meetup. We have XR Nation, we have Vryn, a clean box, and Tesla Suit. Thank you very much for taking part and uh, sponsoring this event today. I want to welcome Demu Olilainen as my co-organizer and co-host. We have a special spatial news for this evening, as we do every All Night Northern XR. Uh, so my friend, will you please take it away? Thank you again. Uh, as per usual, I won't be talking too much, rather share the video, which is going to be actually premiered in YouTube as, as we speak. But this is actually going to be five minutes before that. So let's see what happens. Have fun. Here's special news for this one. Hello and welcome to special news. This is a newscast uh, that is part of Overnight Northern XR. This time we are in June, which means that we will be focusing on Norway in this newscast and also in this overnight. We have a few news pieces from Norway for you guys to listen in. First one is from uh, Ludenso, which is a co-creation AR art exhi exhibition where students created uh, pieces of AR content within uh, a, in their school and their schoolyard. I hope you can see the picture playing uh, there where they managed to uh, create some uh, buildings and whatever blocks that they can then see within their own uh, surroundings. So it was an in immersive learning experience for uh, schools in, in Norway that was created by Ludens. Then we have a report uh, regarding VR training also from Norway where a official report from Haptics Cloudberry VR platform was that uh, they have, uh, it's in Norway, Norway, Norwegian, the, the report itself, but the summary is in English, so links is, link is below there. They, uh, the, let's say that the <coughs> condensed version of that is that uh, they saw that 98% regarded VR simulator as a good meta method of learning uh, new systems and processes. And they saw a 68% reduction in uh, time spent in training using the VR training opposed to a physical surroundings version. So that was interesting piece of uh, information. This was all also already something that we knew that will help a lot uh, doing training in VR, but this uh, report confirms what uh, we kind of have seen also. Then uh, just quick briefly touching upon uh, this, uh, which was quite interesting to at least to my mind, was that VR actually uh, can be used, or VR or virtual reality, uh, can be used as a pain relief for patients. So there's a link to a, a news piece from, from a Norwegian newspaper where they have uh, had a v virtual reality training uh, for seven minutes for patients that have a, it has actually resulted in pain relief for the patients. So I think that's quite interesting topic to explore later on when we are talking about the usage of virtual reality. Then the last piece of the, let's say, uh, first topics is also just with the picture is that Aston Martin has also jumped the bandwagon where they are using virtual reality and augmented reality to present their own uh, products uh, for their customers. So they have partnered up with Vario and Lenovo uh, to produce 
their new Martin D, Mart, Aston Martin DBX without physically being in the uh, in the uh, dealerships and offices, so that people can view the car. But now I think it's time to jump with the Kalles. So let's see what sort of uh, news pieces they have found for us this time. Uh, so we will start with Kalle one. Uh, please. Kalle, take it away. I don't know what you're going to be talking about, so this is going to be a surprise to me as well. Go ahead. Wow! Unreal has released their Unreal Engine 5 as an early access for developers. And look at this. This is quite nice. I mean, Less work, better content. That's what they say. So I think this is awesome. You know, the desert with all the details is, is awesome. And look at this. Now if we jump into the world of, of, oh my God. Yeah, you can really do some nice stuff with it. Please read more about it from Unreal's own words. I don't know. The words doesn't do justice. This is epic. Repeat after me. Epic. Back to you. Okay. Thank you, Kalle, for, for that quite interesting, or let's say, epic news, in a sense. And then, <coughs> made that joke myself, if you didn't notice. <coughs> well, anyway, let's go on. So, we now go with the second color uh, for something regarding Snapchat and Lego, I think, Lego. So that's Danish, not Norwegian, sorry. I guess, maybe. But anyway, take it away. Am I on it? Yes, okay. Hello, Temu. This is now we are within Snapchat. And what is the new thing about this is not the thing that you can do AR uh, by itself, but it's connected lenses, a new feature of functionality within Snapchat, where, okay, you can create, you know, as you can see, Lego in AR. Yeah, okay, -ish. yeah, I, I can live with that. But uh, <coughs> I think the core thing is that you can actually co-create it. So check this out. These two people, or these two people rather, are doing it together from different locations. Oh yes, they are. That is interesting. Right? <laughs> Back to you. Okay, that was quite nice experience. I really need to try that one myself as well. Uh, anyone up for trying out doing some Lego together in Snapchat? Hit me up. Well, anyway, uh, then the last one from the colors is a, uh, I, would, I wouldn't spoil it too much if I say it's related to maybe past uh, wars, what has been happening here in Finland or gaming or how would I say? I don't want to spoil too much. Go ahead, color three, take it away. Yes, I am here. Oh, that was that was very 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 real like experience. Yes, I am whew, very real like. Oui. Uh, when you combine uh, VR with the uh, uh, AR and the physical objects in within you, your gun, you know, like oh, sorry, your gun like that. Woo, that is quite intense. Intense. It is an experience done by Mikiwi and uh, Vario XR3. Yes. The headset, not the headset. Yes, the headset. It is a headset. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you put it in the head and you know, yes, you are in the view. Yes. Whew, very intense. I'm very, very ready to go home. Ah! Right now. P.S. I stole this from Kalevan. Don't tell. Bye. Wow, thank you, Carl Three. That 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 was that was something. That was 
Even though I said epic in the first, I think this was quite epic as well. But uh, yeah, that, that was interesting. Okay, we are now uh, finishing up the news with the uh, final uh, pieces of, of news coming from Finland, where Anaki Labs has uh, debuted with their Air HUD, which is a, uh, they are working on a uh, AR uh, way to control your drones. So if you can see the video playing, so they have drones, AR and smart glasses combined. So that's quite an interesting piece of work, so to say. But do uh, check their website for more information. That's quite revolutionary, I would say even. Then uh, interesting piece again from Finnish company called Zone uh, has done another virtual concert, this time with Nightwish. Uh, it was during last weekend from the 28th to the 29th of May. And uh, the concert was a very, very good success. There was all, almost or over 150,000 participants all over the world, majoring from Europe and North America with those. So that was a double thumbs up kind of thing. Then, uh, just as a note, there's a quite interesting thesis work that has come out of the Uvascular University of Applied Sciences uh, regarding volumetric capture. Unfortunately, it's in Finnish, so if you want to use your Google Translator to see what's what and who's who within that, so please check the link below. That is very interesting as well. But this was the news, special news, brought to you by Exxon Nation. My name is Teemo Lilanen and I wish you a very happy summer, everyone. We'll see you back on September, I guess, or something like that. All right, thank you. To lose the real That was that was interesting. So apologies still for from from Palle's sake. He is really on a grieving streak because uh, Sweden dropped out of the Ice Hockey World Championship. So he, he sends his regards and, and says that he's sorry, but he cannot participate at this time. Well, thank you so much for that demo. Your very uh, informative special <laughs> news episode for this fall night Northern XR Norway in Neon. And now I would like to introduce my co-host for the evening, Keith Melligan, and he is the cluster manager of Bryn Immersive Learning Cluster. Uh, sir, the stage is yours. Please take it away. Well, thank you so much, um, Joe, and uh, really cool with spatial news. Uh, this is the first VR news I've seen with a news anchor uh, talking about cases, and it just feels so real when you see cases from Norway. Uh, and uh, I saw that Ludenso was was being shown there, and Ludenso is actually a, a member inside our cluster, so uh, uh, very cool. And they actually have a competition uh, going on right now, so uh, if you do search them up, uh, you can join their competition. And uh, very cool seeing also high school in, in Lana, the the science project that you, uh, the, the, the scientists are, are checking out if um, if VR really works uh, with patients. Um, they're also part of our cluster, so so yeah, awesome with special news. So I'm super grateful for uh, for uh, being here at the AW Night uh, Norva Norway. Very happy that we can we can finally show what's going on in Norway and what uh, members here are doing. What what's going on? Yeah, so. Uh, really awesome. So I'm going to start off talking about what Vrin is, what kind of cluster it is, what we do within the cluster, what kind of members we have, what kind of partners we have, and uh, what the future is to hold and how we can work together. So first off, uh, I'll just go very quickly with our vision. Uh, we are the immersive learning cluster and our plan is to create the, uh, the future of learning. So we, we do focus on having members that, that, that uh, work with both uh, ed tech and also training in virtual reality. And we also want to secure a global position. And the way we're doing this is by working with, with uh, partners like XR Nation, joining in events um, and creating partnerships outside of Norway to really show what's going on in, in Norway. So the, these are our members. Um, on the right side, uh, we have 
we have a mix of private sector and public sector. On the right side, uh, I placed uh, public, uh, the public sector. Uh, here we have, uh, we have schools, uh, we have hospitals. And we also have municipalities. And uh, if I didn't mention it a bit earlier, uh, Vrin is actually from the public sector. So we're, we're funded by the, the public sector. On the left side, uh, we have private companies that deliver solutions that could work well with the public sector and private sector. So it's, it's a good um, ecosystem. And I'll talk a bit more about the ecosystem here. Um, so our ecosystem is that we have uh, Vrin as a cluster, and uh, we also have investors, partners, and supporters. If you see on the left side, you can see that IKEA uh, is involved, um, and this is, we call it the Park ecosystem, and Park is actually a physical place in a place called Halmud in Norway. It's a building, um, and there we have a lot of companies that then work together. So we try to create a good ecosystem. For, for the cluster, for our members, for so that, you know, the, the future of VR depends on connecting other industries. And that's what we feel we're trying to do um, right now. Um, I mentioned a bit about partners. Um, XR Nation is uh, one of our partners. Uh, unfortunately, I see that the logo hasn't come there, but they are. Uh, we've also partnered up with Laval Virtual and XR for All. And just to talk about Laval Virtual, they're one of the, the biggest um, uh, VR conferences, as well as AWE, uh, and XR for All is, is is connected to to Europe, and we're trying to then connect with these kind of partners so that we can show what's going on in Norway and learn from what's going on also in Europe and and other places. We also have something called Nordic VR Forum, which is a, a pretty large conference. Uh, we have it's we focus we focus mostly on the Nordics, but we also have other countries coming in. So I'm just going to show a video. And then I'll talk a bit more about it. I'm 100 and I'm getting it. Como la mo luxury. I'm when I drop in this. When I turn up, you know I'm on my, on my. Yes, I'm on my, I'm on my, on my. Yes, I'm on my, I am so, I'm so, yes, I am so, I'm on my, I'm on my, I'm on my, I'm on my, I'm on my. That was Nordic VR Forum. Um, before COVID-19, we had around 400, 315 uh, people that joined in. We had, we had quite a few speakers. A uh, big focus on healthcare and education and training. Last year, because of COVID-19, um, it had to be a hybrid event. Uh, so there we had around 700, 700 people that joined in. And part of it was in VR. And we were using a platform that a cluster member uh, called Finn, we're going to have a presentation later, uh, where this was done in, in VR. So people were able to, to, to meet up in VR, see what was going on with presentations. There were also meeting rooms, uh, dev talk inside uh, virtual reality. And we're planning to do the same um, thing uh, at the end of November. So very open to discuss if you, if you have any speakers uh, within XR Nation or AWE that'd like to, to come in or exhibit something or show something, you know, feel free to contact me. So uh, what we're going to do now is that we're going to continue with the program where we're, uh, there's going to be some interesting talks, uh, both about uh, multiplayer and storytelling and uh, the industry uh, building and also education. So first stop, the first uh, member that's going to talk is Finn Reality, and they're the ones that were behind the VR solution at our Nordic VR forum. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you very much for uh, letting us uh, join you today and um, doing a little presentation. I'm just going to switch over to the other seat because we were doing um, a live demo 
Okay, um, so we're going to demo the virtual room that we made for teaching um, the correct use and preparation of medication um, for various patient groups. Um, this was a collaboration with uh, the Inland Norway University of Applied Sciences and their education um, for nurses. Um, so this is, uh, this is one of the really impactful uses uh, of virtual reality training um, that we've been doing lately. It's really a copy of an actual room that they have there with the, all the medications available that the students will have to use and familiarize themselves with. Of course, if you turn around it, um, this is virtual reality. So we are able to extend it into as much space as we want. And we're also able to add uh, TVs for presentations, um, for teachers to do uh, PowerPoints and everything everything that you benefit from in VR. Um, we're also able to do a lot of calculations in the background um, that's not possible uh, in reality. So every pill um, and every liquid, um, every injection in this uh, virtual reality trainer is connected to a set of parameters. Um, so when the student mixes any kind of medication, uh, everything is calculated in the background and they can get their results uh, immediately. Um, so what you have here is uh, a fictional patient's medical history. Uh, and this medical history says something about what their previous diagnoses have been, um, which uh, preparations they are using today, um, and what you need to, um, to make sure that they get for this week. Um, so here you have all the information that you need, uh, and this is uh, this has been done. The, the background information, and everything, has been done by uh, by two professors at the at the university college. Um, they've done a marvelous job with this. So everything is uh, everything is done in a very um, pedagogical way. So the students start with a very simple case, and then they build their knowledge um, through every single case they have one or two little things that they need to be aware of. Um, so they learn new things to be aware of with every case. Um, I believe in this case, there's a little thing that they don't necessarily know. Um, and it's uh, that one of the, one of the medications um, is not there, it's not available. And what do you do then? Because this is a very common thing that they will meet uh, in real life when you can't find um, Cipramil which is the, the tablet that they're supposed to do now. Um, if you can't find it, you need to look through the register for something that you can, uh, can switch it to. Um, and this is uh, inside of this one, we have uh, the live uh, catalog for medications. Um, so this is a Norwegian register for all medication and all um, switchable uh, equal medications that they can switch to um, and they have to be aware that uh, even if you do use something that is supposed to be similar um, the dosage might be different um, so the student need to check everything um, this is in Norwegian as I said um, so it's uh, but I think it's it's very uh, very much the same for other countries um, so it should be a very easy uh, program to translate and to add to other other countries as well um, okay, Knut, so if you try to make the preparation for this patient. Yeah, we can do so. Uh, we can start on the top, just uh, do a quick do one. Um, we can take the tablet. Uh, you see that uh, there is a uh, Tegretol, it's a uh, 100 milligram on, uh, in the morning and in the evening. Um, if I do so, it has to be calculated through this section here. So I can catch that one and then I have to look at it. It's uh, <laughs> 200 milligram and it says 100 and 100 so I had to divide it and I had to look at the date to see if it's uh, available yet and then I can uh, take it out. That's another little uh, handy thing that they need to check because in one of the yeah. cases uh, the pills have been there expired um, and if they don't notice that then they will fail. So he just used uh, a splitter for the pill to make sure it's half of the 200 milligrams. It's also connected to the date, so it's important for me to have a be sure that I'm on Monday. So if it's Monday, I have to use this one. It could be different, but uh, of course, that's the key of today. 
And I see that it's uh, Monday, it's in the morning uh, to add it to this one. And then I add another one to the evening, correct it again. Yes, check that one. And then I can uh, mark them out. Yeah, so he has to sign, and that's really the important part because when he signs the uh, the sheet, um, that sort of seals the deal. Um, and uh, uh, in the back here, everything is calculated. So when when he's done with uh, with one patient, um, everything uh, everything is is calculated, um, and you can see where exactly they did anything wrong, if they did anything wrong, and um, if everything's right. So this is the next one. And I can either take this one, which is 40 milligram, or I can take this one, which is 10 milligram, because I will have 20. So maybe I should make it like this, take two of this one instead. See that brown? That's in the morning. So then I add it to the morning for one, which is 10. <laughs> then I add another one. So I'm sure I have uh, 20. And then I can correct this one. Sign the sheet. Sign. Perfect. Yeah. And we can continue through all of them, of course, and also liquid things and uh, to check if I'm doing well. Close it. And put it into this one. Close the lid and place it in the right spot. And um, then I try to do it here. And you see that uh, I have a lot of trouble inside. I got uh, correct. This one is correct. It's okay. Okay. This one is not correct. So those two I did in the first place is correct. And those I didn't do, I have got uh, yeah. mistakes on. And you can see that it specifies um, a lack of uh, the correct tablet in the morning uh, on Monday um, and that it's supposed to be 70 milligrams and you forgot to sign for the morning. So you're supposed to sign and then the program is uh, acting like your co-signer of the, of the charts because you're supposed to be two people uh, always checking that everything is correct. So uh, this version doesn't have a, a, an examination mode. So he's able to add the tablet back if he sees that it's, um, that it's not right. So all in all, this is made with a gradual progress uh, in the cases so that uh, in the end uh, everything combined uh, gives the students what they need to combat the most uh, the usually most fatal uh, errors in medication handling in Norway today. Um, so this is uh, hopefully it, well it's it's being tested and piloted now um, and we are hoping that it will be something that can be of very real use fairly soon. Uh, and today, everything is um, everything that you see here that they're doing today is done um, with pen and paper uh, as just calculations. It's really just maths, which makes it perfect for VR because we can do everything in the background without uh, without doing any letting them do any of the math uh, on pen and paper. Um, also, it gives the students an understanding of both how these pills look, um, the volumes. What does it actually mean when you have uh, 100 milliliters? How does it look? How does it feel? Um, which is surprisingly one of the, the really real things that they struggle with on their exams because it's so easy to get lost in the numbers. Um, but when you, have, when you have a bottle in front of you, it's a lot more real how much is in that bottle. Um, we do have some injections as well um, that's being implemented in, in the more advanced cases. So the first case is really just paracetamol, just to give the students uh, some room to understand. Um, and here you see the how the injections work. Um, the student has to actually work the equipment uh, just like they would otherwise. So this gives them a, a real understanding of how everything works as well. So it's um, hopefully a very sort of uh, holistic approach to training uh, this kind of uh, these kind of students and nurses. And it's also important to say that this is a fully multiplayer uh, solution that gives you the opportunity to have a, a social space in there. You can have 30 people inside here and do the streaming, you do the voice, voice communication fully, and you can add in everything that you like. So it's a complex system that we have, uh, are very satisfied with. Uh, 
taking to your taking to the market now. And of course, this is built on our our um, platform core. Um, so everything is uh, available for VR and PC at the same time. So you can have 30 users, uh, some on PC at home, some joining in through uh, through the screen in the back, um, and some in VR actually doing the task. So it's um, it's a very uh, very complex, but also very functional um, and flexible system. Running Unity on Azure Microsoft. <laughs> platform that we have built yeah. on the real Very interesting, very advanced um, training. Uh, I do have some questions, but I think I'll, I'll, uh, I'll wait until the uh, Q&A at the end. And uh, we'll have to move over to the next speaker. Uh, but great presentation, uh, Knut and uh, Christina. So the next speaker so is uh, Sham from uh, 3D Learning. And 3D Learning is a company that has over 200 schools. Um, using their products and uh, some of their products work. I mean, is virtual reality and augmented reality. So uh, Sham, give it away. Okay, 3D Learning is a company based in uh, Sandefjord in Norway, a beautiful city. Uh, thank you all for uh, taking time off uh, from your dinner and uh, staying awake after dinner in Finland. Uh, we are basically involved, our target audience is schools. And now I'm talking about primary, middle and secondary schools. So. K to 13 in Norwegian terms. Uh, we deliver on uh, both the PC platform as well as AR and VR. Uh, the image on the left in Norwegian is basically a survey after one year of use uh, based on student reactions, a word cloud, which talks about what are the various uh, expressions that they had about how we, they used our product. Uh, this project has been, uh, uh, this product has been supported by uh, the Norwegian government in various districts, but importantly, it has been, it has got the validation, not only from our clients, but also Startped, which is the pedagogical organization, uh, national pedagogical organization in Norway, and as part of the education department gives a subsidy to schools when they buy our product. The industry level, HP and uh, Microsoft, we have partnered with them for various initiatives. There's a video here, which I will not run because it's completely in Norwegian. It's uh, done by Stadped, the pedagogics organization about how it was actually used in schools. That was about two years back. Uh, as uh, Keith mentioned, we are in about 200 schools. A large number of these use AR on mobility devices. Some of them use uh, VR. Our whole system is run on a platform which makes it easy to scale up internationally. Our approach has been uh, with a good understanding of the school sector. Uh, our approach has been to make sure that uh, the solution is cost effective, that it leverages existing infrastructure investments. This is because the schools are very quick to make investments in uh, iPads and computers and not that quickly when it comes to content. Uh, teacher acceptance has been one of our focal areas. A large number of teachers uh, have a resistance. I wouldn't say a resistance, have an have insecurity when they wish to use uh, emerging technologies. It can be, it could have emerged 20 years back like 3D models, but they have an uh, hesitancy in using it. Uh, so we work a lot with teacher acceptance and then go on to introduce the new or exciting options such as AR and VR. Uh, the, our AR solution is completely based on mobility devices. We, we have a large library of curated content. We use image recognition and surface detection. Uh, just to give you an idea here, a short video about uh, solar system. So they studied the solar system on, uh, in the book. They studied the solar system in 3D on our own app. They viewed the solar system in VR and then they're able to actually see what is the position of the planets at real time, very similar to the astronomy app that's available in other places, except that this is all integrated into the curriculum of the school in the right manner. And what happens with this is it got very interesting when we got a feedback from one of the teachers, something is wrong with the program because uh, Jupiter is down. Uh, yeah, Jupiter is down because it is uh, in that position, the Earth is round. 
Uh, there have also been field trips out where they could uh, pick up uh, dinosaurs, for example, or a human anatomy lab, which they set up in a football field using their mobiles and iPads and learned about it. This helped to get about some variation in education. Going back to our core element, uh, which is cost effectiveness, variation in education, and the practicalities of a school. You know, the, the digital world has come into schools, but the classroom is still exactly the same as it was several years back. There are tables and chairs. There is not enough place for movement and trying out new things. So we have adapted our own solution to address what the classroom situation is and all that. When you come to VR, uh, it's been an interesting ride. Uh, we started with uh, Niburu as an experiment, uh, Niburu operating system with cheap uh, VR glasses to just get an idea of, okay, what is the take on it? And from there, we have been, uh, we have used Daydream, uh, Google Daydream, uh, Oculus Go, but now we are mostly on Oculus Go and Oculus Quest 2. We hope to do something on HoloLens. Uh, Microsoft has been kind enough to give us a HoloLens uh, free of cost, but uh, the uh, demand for HoloLens across a large number of schools is quite not there. In VR, it's uh, one is exploring the elements that are related to the curriculum, you also have a lot of other activities such as quiz, puzzles. You can create your own world using our curated libraries and scenes. You can create 3D objects. Just a quick, I have to stop the video because of the music, but basically what we can do over here is to explore it across, right from dinosaurs and bats to complex human anatomy and uh, uh, power systems. You can create various kind of scenes in this. For example, students can end up wiring up a house, uh, could end up uh, creating a underwater scene. You could create content in other software, such as, for example, Tinkercad or uh, Blender, etc., and input it in here. And that makes it interesting because a school buys, let's say, 16 VR Oculus 2 headsets, but they have 200 iPads. How do you keep all the students engaged? So the students create 3D models on Tinkercad or Blender, and then it is imported into our app, 3DL app. And in the 3DL app, it is completely available for them to lay it out in whatever way they want. So we are using VR tightly integrated with the Norwegian curriculum because that's what the teachers understand. Our approach is to make it available as broadly as possible. In order to make it available as broadly as possible, because the numbers matter over here, uh, when we talk of the 600,000 students in K-13 to in uh, Norway, if we are able to get 100,000 of them to, get, to use VR, then we are making progress right at the school level. So all of our content is. So in addition to what we are doing with schools, we are also some conducting for the first time in Norway, I have to say, summer camps, which where the focus is completely on 3D, AR, and VR. So far, we have 270 students in four locations who are going to be participating in these one-week summer camps where they're going to be using Oculus Quest 2 uh, as the primary VR device. They're going to be using Tinkercad. They're going to be doing... And all these students are from the fem fifth to the 10th grade. We have one more district, which is uh, which we are waiting the, an answer on. And when that comes in, we will probably touch about 600 students who will be trying out VR and AR for education. And this gives us a very good basis to further develop the project. To put it in another way, we are... Uh, we make a rather complex solution, but which can be easily used by the teachers, which means we deliver everything to the school. Everything from hygiene masks to VR glasses to setting up the VR glasses for them to loading up all the content for them and to handle training sessions. So we create the content, we create our app, we ensure that the school uses it, and we literally handhold them through the whole process. What we are looking for in terms of network is to make sure that you know, there's a lot of money created or spent on content creation. And what we are looking for is good partners whose content we are able to package and distribute to the schools in Norway, thereby lowering the overall cost of content across the world. We have good market access and we have good penetration within the school sector. That's uh, quickly about us so that I don't take much more time than what's allotted. And I hope that gave you an idea. Anytime you can uh, write to us, contact us, and we are available for Q&A after this. Thank you very much. Very, very good, Shem. Very good. Very uh, interesting to see how good penetration you have with the schools and uh, not very many companies 
had that many clients. So it's super, super interesting. Um, next up, uh, you know, we'll keep the questions for the Q and A if that's okay. And next up will be Guide. Uh, Guide is from a company called Trigun. A guide himself has a military background and good experience with training. Um, they work with uh, creating, well, VR content for training specifically. Guide, you can tell us more about that. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me, Joe. Um, we are actually, uh, from what I've seen, the last meetups when the VR uh, scene uh, usually... We, we come in from the other side to say it like that because we are not focused on the, the technology. Uh, we do not focus on the possibilities in five years. We focus on what technology can do now because the technology is just a vessel uh, or a means to an end. And that end is uh, conditioning, uh, basic training, uh, as simple as possible for operational uh, occupations. Uh, that, that could be anything from nurses to people in uh, old people's homes and the police, military, EMTs, uh, every occupation that has a lot to do with people or, and especially people in difficult circumstances. Uh, someone told me that I should do the movie first, so I'll do that. Uh, there's no sound, uh, so I'll do the sound. <laughs> so we don't use the controller. Uh, we use the Pico and the headset to lock all senses uh, inside the goggles. Uh, the menu is very simple. Uh, course, scenario, routines, and it's choosing course. And then it gets into the violence and threats or the first aid module. Uh, and he's looking at CPR done with the Norwegian First Aid Council. So it's pretty much a step-by-step, -step, but also it could be a, an intense experience. And this is still the course menu, back to main menu, and you can choose scenario or routines. I'm not going to bother you anymore with, uh, with the video. Uh, like he said, we're from the military, and the, the background is uh, the fear of failing, actually. The lack of basic training uh, in the basics of an occupation, uh, any occupation. I'm guessing I have seven minutes, so I'm just going to start my countdown on five now sorry about that um that, that's been a lot of situations that will follow you uh, when you fail uh, can be easily managed by training in the right way it's called conditioning uh, if you if you're training and working on tools that you will need mental tools you will need uh, while you're in an acute dangerous situation you will have to uh, do the training and the programming and the visualization uh, and the conditioning while your body is in some kind of uh, stress reaction mode. Uh, that way you program uh, the tools you will need into the right part of your brain. Uh, the, the focus is extremely uh, simple. Uh, what we do in everyday life is usually focusing on uh, operational psychology uh, stress reactions uh, and, and what's called uh, performance psychology. It's been uh, used a lot in the sports, uh, but also the military are starting to adopt it. And I see that everyone who is interested in uh, performing, even at the very basic level, has a lot to, to, to uh, there's a lot of value to it to train like that. Uh, we, we do this in 360 film because the price and uh, the scalability is very, very good. Uh, we, we have the application, we spend a lot of money on that, uh, to us, a lot of money, <laughs> uh, but it's very cheap. Uh, anyone can buy a license over a year and everything we have within uh, violence and threats training, uh, incident control, uh, first aid, we have a lot of uh, scenarios uh, made for the uh, health services, uh, all of the health services, schools, uh, and service uh, occupations. And uh, the bank is growing, and we're starting to release more and more. Uh, and the concept is it should be very easy to use. My mother can use it. If you can put, put on a set of glasses and put your finger in your ear, you can use this system. 
Uh, the only thing you have to do is plug in the loader or, or the charger or we will, uh, the cask mode comes back on when you put the loader back in. But uh, that's the only thing that can really go wrong is that it's a flat battery. Um, the 360 film, we do that ourselves. Uh, we are the concept and the methods people. Uh, our expertise was in uh, incident control, crisis management. Uh, now it's more of a concept of how to deliver uh, experiences, first person, second person, spectator, uh, concerning what kind of scenario or routine or drill we are showing. Uh, or in a course, we're trying to go get away completely from the classroom. We, we have the technology, we have the imagination and the possibilities to take the, the, the concept away from the classroom where everyone sits down and the, someone is standing in front of them and telling them stuff with words because words are only here to create images in your head. Uh, I'm trying to transfer images from my head in, into your head by using words and words are really not the best way to do that. Uh, when we have virtual reality and cameras and uh, graphics we can lay on. Uh, so we're trying to negate the language barrier and what we do, most of what we do, you can voice over in any language as it's gonna, and it's scalable to another country. Uh, yeah, I really don't have a lot more. Uh, I see I have one minute left. Um, do you have any comments, Keith? Um, yeah, well, you know, I'll, I'll keep it for the Q&A. I have a, a lot of questions about uh, the psychology uh, of learning, uh, but I'm, I think I'll just take out the Q&A and ask you guys. Ask then you guys. I'll give my minute to someone else. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for the, for the interesting talk. Um, interesting to see 360 content. And I completely agree that 360 content can be cost effective and can scale a lot faster than six off experiences sometimes. I completely agree with that. Uh, so next up, uh, we'll have um, Illegal, IS, uh, Christopher from Illegal. And I'm um, assuming you're going to present the Tesla suit and uh, fire training with Tesla suit. Thank you. Thank you, Keith and Joe. Uh, by some reason, my uh, name is uh, from a partner of ours. So I uh, <laughs> really don't know what uh, what happened there, but uh, I'm not named Porn and Co. I'm named Christopher. So uh, <laughs> sorry for that. Uh, I'll try to I'll try to share my screen and I'm going to show you a small presentation of who we are and what we do in the fields of uh, XR. Yeah, as uh, as Keith mentioned, I'm gonna I'm gonna speak shortly about uh, the Tesla suit uh, as we are a official partner of them here in the Nordics. Um, and I'm also going to to speak about how this can be used in in different uh, fields and especially in emergency preparedness training. And then especially firefighting. Uh, so just to be quick about us, we are a, a XR company providing uh, custom made solutions for, uh, for clients, especially within uh, safety and uh, preparedness training. Uh, and we do believe that uh, each client wants their own uh, customized uh, experience. So we have our, our general platform where we create um, uh specific experiences for 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 each client uh so i'm not going to talk too much about that uh but but as mentioned uh we have the uh the tesla suit um and i don't know how much you guys know about it probably you heard about it it's been uh, on the market for some for some time now uh but in short it is a uh, a suit with a jacket and uh, pants uh, that is uh, full of, uh, I would say, immersive technology. Um, it can be uh, it can be used for various um, various uh, fields, uh, as mentioned, for for uh, preparedness training, but also within uh, the healthcare sector. We've actually been um, working with uh, with a client here in Norway uh, uh, that has got patients that is both blind and deaf. Uh, as well as, um, uh, yeah, and uh, actually been thinking about how we can use this technology for them. Uh, also been um, within the field of uh, rehabilitation for uh, for different uh, patients. So so we we believe it's uh, it's a huge uh, 
uh, there are huge possibilities for, for using this, uh, this suit. And uh, it uh, consists of uh, three main technologies. One of them is haptics, uh, as hopefully some of you guys know about. Uh, it got uh, 80 plus different um, channels, uh, which makes us, gives us the opportunity to, to create very specific uh, scenarios uh, for the user. Uh, it consists of EMS and TENS, uh, meaning we can, uh, we can override the uh, muscles in the body. Uh, so uh, so uh, speaking of uh, firefighting training, for instance, uh, if, you, if you get hit by, uh, by, by, by something in, in a virtual uh, environment, we're actually able to to uh, simulate that pain or whatever feeling you might experience based on that. Um, uh, so we do that uh, through the haptics um, and we also do have a, a calibration system uh, so that these experiences are um, custom to each person that uses it. Um, which is, uh, which is quite important. Uh, we also have the motion capture in the suit, uh, currently supporting 10 uh, sensors uh, in the suit. And uh, we believe this is a quite uh, new way of thinking about motion capture because the suit is fully, um, it's fully uh, wireless, meaning you can go wherever you want as long as you're connected to the, uh, to the Wi-Fi. Uh, and all of this data can be stored in any applications afterwards, meaning you can, uh, you can uh, use this for debriefing or whatever after, uh, after the experience. Um, and in the end, we also support biometry. Uh, we do have a uh, ECG in the suit, uh, meaning we can um, monitor the, uh, the heart rate of the user. And we're also uh, able by combining all these technologies together to actually uh, analyze the stress level uh, and to, to, to some extent, the emotional state of, of the user. So we can uh, also be using this for, for, for instance, debriefing uh, after, uh, after the experience. So, so one example which we've been working on uh, that I want to present for you uh, is the, um, the smoke diving within VR. So we were actually asked uh, by, by a client here in Norway to, to create a VR solution for uh, doing smoke diving uh, virtually. Um, and the first issue that they came up with was the fact that they um, it's not enough to just see things visually uh, in, a, in, a, in an experience, they actually need to feel it directly onto their body uh, to, to get up the uh, realness of the, um, of the experience. Uh, so what we did was that we took the, uh, we took the Tesla suit. Uh, this was actually done initially with the Vive Pro. Now uh, we've uh, accredited it to, to the Oculus Quest um, and uh, got the, uh, got the uh, smoke mask as well, as well as uh, then the HPZ uh, backpack. Uh, now we've removed that. Um, but um, but that also gave a uh, visualization of having this uh, oxygen tank that they uh, usually do have on their backs. So so we put, uh, did put all of this uh, into their uh, original um, outfits, and the result was this. So for 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 them, it was super important to to be as close to the to the real world as possible. Um, meaning they wanted to use the full full suit as well. Uh, and for uh, when they're doing smoke diving, they're, they're also working in a team. So we made this as a multiplayer solution. Uh, it was also, um, it was also um, fitted into an actual room, uh, meaning that the, when they do these kind of searches, they do it uh, through the physical walls. So. The, the virtual walls was connected to the physical wall. Um, so I'm just going to show you a small video from this. Uh, you're not going to hear that much, but uh, here they're searching for, for the patient uh, when they're, uh, I think, moving a bit closer now. You can see it's a visual, uh, it's a virtual explosion. explosion. 
and the person using the suit actually got this feedback onto onto their body, uh, making it even more realistic. Mm-hmm. Um, when uh, when extinguishing uh, water from the from the hose, they were also given a recoil. Um, uh, from the suit, um, we're also uh, able to to capture um, biometrics uh, uh, from the suit as well. Uh, you know, uh, as well as the motion capture, uh, in order to um, to give a more um, clear view of what the user actually were experiencing. So um, I was also uh, asked to just quickly say some words about the. Um, another partner of ours that is called uh, Cleanbox. I'm not going to speak too much about that, uh, but I think it's um, some other uh, some other use cases uh, where, where we've been uh, enabling this, uh, this tool is uh, one for Schlumberger, uh, basically the same as, uh, as shown the, in the previous video, uh, using both VR and Tesla suit. And I think Another interesting uh, one is uh, is the energy company called DTEC uh, using both VR and uh, and Tesla suit, and they were actually um, they actually showed some interesting uh, interesting results uh, when introducing the Tesla suit. They were originally just using VR, but by introducing uh, the Tesla suit to to their uh, training scenarios in VR, they actually managed to to drop um, mistakes during training up to 53%, which I think is quite amazing, uh, as well as um, correct performances were, uh, were increased by 12%, uh, and also time during the actual training dropped by 9%. So um, you can actually achieve quite much by, by using this, uh, this technology. Um, yeah, and uh, for for those who uh, are into into health, uh, not not health tech, but uh, but into um, but into um, into the cleaning uh, cleaning industry, we are also working with a company called Cleanbox for um, for uh, handling um, for sanitizing. Uh, VR headsets. Uh, so uh, it's a uh, basically a box where you where you put the VR headset into, and uh, after one minute you you have this uh, UV cleaning uh, uh, that uh, provides 99.9 percent bacteria free after just one minute. So so that's also a good thing to to bring onto the market in uh, in these times. So um, yeah. That was uh, that was me and uh, in Lego. So um, thank you guys. Thank you so much, Christopher. Very cool seeing how haptic can be used for for virtual training and and seeing that there's a box called Clean Box that can clean your VR headset, especially in the time of COVID nineteen. That is super 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 important. So uh, we'll you know we'll keep the Q and A. Uh, uh, for later. Uh, so next up, um, I'm going to call uh, you Joe Adrian from uh, Glitch Studios, where he's going to be talking about virtual museum and photogrammetry and how they did it. So I'm super excited about this talk. Okay, so um, it's your turn, Joe Adrian. All right. I uh, hope you can hear me. Um, so uh, let me just start the presentation. So, uh, my name is uh, you, Adrian Havin. Uh, I am uh, immersive director at uh, Glitch uh, Studios, and uh, I'm going to talk to you about uh, Rual Amundsen's house, which is an immersive museum project that launched uh, just before Christmas of last year. <laughs> Thank you. 
right, so um, just a couple of words about uh, Glitch Studios. Uh, we are an uh, immersive digital studio and use new uh, technologies to create opportunities for our clients. Um, we uh, are basic, based on the sales and marketing agency, but we do uh, have mostly customers in two sectors, uh, engineering, um, visualizing complex uh, solutions, data centers, um, um, power solutions, etc. And then we have a lot of clients within the museum sector uh, where we do educational and experience projects. Uh, I can mention a few. Uh, we have done a um, 360 uh, tour of um, Tour Heidel's uh, journey across the Pacific on the Kotiki raft, uh, narrated by uh, Tour Heidel's son, uh, Tur Heidel Jr. Um, reading from uh, Tur Heidel's diary, where you could actually um, experience how it was uh, on the fleet in the middle of the Pacific. Um, we have done uh, a museum 360 experience with the um, Constitutional Museum in Norway, where you met uh, video characters, green screen uh, video characters, and were able to interact with objects um, in the experience. And um, in uh, the project uh, represented by the top left uh, image, um, the Dina Stone, we started uh, started really going into photogrammetry using a photogrammetry scan of the uh, Dina Bauta Stone, um, uh, where the audience could interact uh, with the digital copy, copy of the stone uh, through motion sensors. Um, and this kind of led us into the project uh, that I'm going to talk about today. Um, so Roald Amundsen was a famous Norwegian explorer, kind of a superstar of his uh, time. Um, he was the first, uh, he led the first exp expedition to the South Pole. He was the first undisputed uh, reacher of the North Pole uh, and the first to cross the Northwest uh, Canal. Um, on the uh, 17th of June 1928, um, he locked the door to his house, uh, Uranienburg, uh, and uh, went out on a mission to save his kind of arch nemesis, Umberto Nobile, uh, an Italian airship captain who had uh, crashed uh, south of the North Pole. Um, Roald Amundsen took a car to Oslo, a train to Bergen, where he boarded a French uh, plane with a French crew and Norwegian pilots, traveled to Tromsø, and he was uh, last seen uh, taking off from the Tromsø harbor. Uh, they got some radio messages a couple of hours later, and then he was kind of lost forever. Uh, and uh, the house that he lived in, uh, what you see on the uh, on the picture, is standing almost like a time capsule uh, back to the 1920s, uh, almost exactly as he left it. Um, it became a museum in 1935, um, and uh, the Follow Museum, which was our client in this uh, project, uh, they wanted a way to uh, make this house accessible. Uh, it's based 20, no, 45 minutes outside Oslo. Um, it's kind of hard to get to. And once you get there, it's uh, only open 20 days uh, a year. And there can only be 10 people at a time uh, before Corona, that was, um, with the guided tour. So it's, it has a very limited reach. So um, they approached uh, us um, and uh, together we designed a concept around how to make this house available. Uh, so we um we quickly turned to that we would like to use photogrammetry for this uh, project um a technique that has been used for decades in museums but uh, often those scans are really crude uh, but we wanted a kind of best in class photogrammetry uh, project um not only for uh 
presentation uh, of the of the house and objects, but also uh, for preservation. So this house is situated by the fjord, and every year it's it's um, in jeopardy of being taken by a flood. So through making an exact di digital clone, we could actually preserve this house in an event of it burning down or being taken by the water. Um, and that was also a kind of key aspect to the funds that they received to do this project. Um, so of, uh, probably you all know uh, photogrammetry, but um, uh, very short, it's the process of taking a lot of the digital images of an object or a, or a location and the stitching these images together in the software, uh, making a, a complete 3D object, um, a digital 3D object. So we used the medium uh, format digital camera to capture high quality images and uh, process this in the re in reality capture on a really high end PC with 120 gigabytes of RAM and two times uh, RTX uh, 2080 Ti uh, video cards. Um, we manually decimated uh, these in ZBrush, uh, we clean the textures in Mari and Photoshop, and we applied material properties in Mari. And what we got was uh, a very high visual quality. As you can see, you can zoom in on millimeter precision uh, on the objects. And this is the quality that we have uh, across the whole house in the VR experience. Um, we added ambisonic audio. Uh, that means that you could lean into the into the windows and hear the, the birds singing outside. Uh, the the wind is is blowing in the pipe of the oven. Uh, the floor is is um, is creaking. Uh, so everything to make the user feel grounded uh, in the experience. We also have, uh, I think it's about 35 interactable objects in the experience, uh, which we made a, a UI um, where you can place video, photos or text uh, to make the user really that they really can explore the house uh, on their own. Um, and making this into um, a kind of a solo uh, museum experience. Um, and um, yeah, uh, so the um, and this photogrammetry scan, we also used it as a basis for uh, immersive um, website for the client. So um, VR, as you all know, has a limited reach and uh, we wanted this this uh, high quality 3D content to be accessible to more than the ones who have a VR headset. Um, so uh, we made um, uh, VR, uh, the VR experience, uh, an immersive web experience with collections, uh, the largest collections of, of uh, Amundsen um, um, artifacts uh, in the world, uh, and also a sketch fab um, collection with all the 3D, uh, 3D um, uh, objects and also all the rooms with annotations. So you could actually visit the house uh, through web or AR through the uh, Sketchfire app. We also made a site specific app uh, for when the museum was closed, uh, where you could access content from Amazon's uh, uh, life and also the, uh, the AR models of, um, of both the house and his uh, models. Um, so uh, since, the, uh, since uh, launch on Steam, we have about uh, 500, no, 5,000 uh, users um, that has been um, uh, what do you call it, exploring his house. So it has already created a, a, an increased reach for the museum, uh, more than tripling their, their, uh, their visitor numbers uh, already. So using this high-end photogrammetry scan of his house and belongings, um, we could conserve the, the house and this object um, 
allow the audience to explore this collection um, and lift this tiny um, Norwegian museum up to a, a, a global stage, uh, making it accessible uh, for everyone. Uh, and uh, I'm definitely going to ask some more questions on the Q&A. Uh, we're running a bit out of time, uh, so I'll just go quite quick to the next speaker, and that's going to be Rune Vandle uh, from Vixel. So uh, uh, VRX is our uh, off-the-shelf software that we sell uh, for VR. Uh, it's a uh, very niche software. It's for industrial. Now it's for yeah, industry and uh, construction, uh, but it's mostly for complex uh, and large construction projects. So the whole idea behind VRX is to uh, use VR to have uh, a band improved understanding across the whole projects in between uh, different uh, disciplines. We did a study last year with the PBC UK and uh, on average uh, on all the issues that we uh, tested, uh, we managed to reduce the decision-making time with 90%. And in a construction project, having 10 weeks of decision-making time is not uh, uncommon. So the case study I'm gonna run you through is uh, a huge infrastructure project that goes on in Norway at the moment. It's about 2 billion euros project, 10 kilometers of tunnel underneath uh, Oslo with six new train stations. So it's a pretty complex project with about 200 engineers uh, trying to collaborate, make this uh, project happen. So it's a lot of different uh, disciplines working on a project like that. You have the project manager trying to coordinate designers and users, uh, maintenance, the building owner, general contractors, uh, a lot of stuff uh, going on. Uh, and VRAX is basically the teams for BIM, where basically you can come in and have a digital building meeting inside the building instead of having it on a shared screen on Teams. They use two applications in this uh, software. Enscape is our partners in Germany, and it makes uh, things look nice. And uh, VRAX is, uh, so they, in the project, they call it uh, Enscape is the dining room, VRAX is the kitchen. Uh, so that's uh, more like the everyday. They create uh, huge, massive 3D models for this project, down to every single little uh, um, yeah, door handle uh, in, uh, in this project. Um, and they have point clouds of the whole city as well. So there's a huge uh, BIM uh, data set that we need to, uh, need to process. And they have weekly de deliveries from uh, all the 200 engineers working on it. They have weekly deliveries of their data. They do automatic de clash detection to find mistakes where you see pipes are clashing and then things are going wrong uh, in between different disciplines. And the result of those models are being recreated on all the problems that are being detected and are accumulated into VREX automatically. So every week we have the accumulation of the results uh, in VREX. So you can go in there from either with VR or with the laptop. You can go in there and have a digital building meetings and discuss those problems. And this is where the Decision-making is reduced. Everyone understands the problem immediately and can quickly make a decision on what's the correct um, answer to that. There's a small video showing how it works. So the idea here is not to make it uh, look nice. It's going to look, uh, it's supposed to look exactly like it is in the project file. And so you arrive in the model and then you meet uh, the other person. So Angie there is the project manager in Oslo and Mauro is the architect from Saha Did Architects in London. And we connect uh, integrate with the uh, um, project management system. So you can automatically connect to those uh, clashes that you saw earlier. So you basically can click on any topic you want to discuss. You're brought to that location in the model and you can stand there and discuss this problem. So there's a cable bridge clashing in the ceiling. And you need to design, is it the ceiling that needs to be moved down or is it the cable bridge that needs to be moved up? And then the person in charge of that uh, model, part of that part of the model, needs to get the message about that and then go into the code system to uh, make the correction. So we have some tools, some pretty basic tools uh, compared to other VR solutions, but uh, ways to communicate back what is the solution. So in this case, it's basically doing a, a simple markup. The, the problem with the project like this is that everything needs to follow the ISO standard. So you have very limited uh, tools to work with to get this across. So you have basically images, you have uh, X, Y, Z positions, object IDs, and those kind of things. So then it basically adds that uh, as a comment to that issue. And once it uh, completes his uh, voice to text uh, message, 
and he clicks add, that uh, is automatically sent an email to the person in charge of that uh, model. So every Monday, it's not uncommon to have 200 of those issues that needs to be addressed. And they quickly go run through them and then uh, get back to work. And then that's repeated every week for seven years to complete that project. So pretty, pretty intense. So we are uh, proud to say that we're pretty much the most powerful VR system on the market, that we have no capacity, capacity limit, and there's uh, trillions of uh, polygons uh, running through this system. Um, and because of data security, we have no file sharing, and uh, everything happens automatically in the cloud. So there's no, um, uh, yeah, obviously computer and computer and competitors have to share files, and that's, uh, that's a no-go for doing projects like this. Some of our customers are mostly large uh, building owners, like Bosch, they have 300 factories around the world. And uh, you have uh, Skanska, which is the general contractor. Um, yeah, so those are typically our customers. That's um, all the slides I had. Yeah, that was a, that was a very good presentation, uh, Runa, and very, um... Uh, you know, I've used your software and I, I find it very interesting how automatic it is that you just place the 3D files, even heavy BIM 3D files, and they automatically go in the system and the multiplayer system works automatically. So it's, uh, it's a very, 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 very good system. <laughs> very impressive work. All right. So that's it for uh, all the presentations. And now we're over to Q&A. And um, I'll just, um, if there's anyone that has any questions, uh, you guys go first and then I'll, I have a couple questions, but I'll help you guys go first. Uh, excuse me, Keith, if, if we could per perhaps pick like the, the juiciest, most controversial question, like per, for, per person, so we don't have much, much more time, but of course I I'd definitely like to hear like uh, some of the really good ones. Um, yeah, sure, definitely. Um... I don't, uh, yeah, if there's anyone that has any questions, go for it. I don't, uh, Joe, I don't have a list of the questions. Do you? Uh, uh, no, there's, there are no questions in the chat, for example, but I, I thought that maybe if you had, like if you had a few questions for, for the uh, participants. Yeah, uh, all right. So we have a question from Alexa. So I'll go for that. Um, what is the biggest challenge these days for each of them? So that means uh, everyone here, uh, you guys ready to answer? I'm just going to pick someone and then you answer. And I see Runa seems to be ready, so I'll go for him first. Yeah, there's definitely the hardware and uh, being needing a, a huge, uh, powerful laptop uh, connected to the VR headset to run these massive models is uh, definitely the biggest uh, hurdle. Uh, but the next year, we, are, we have in beta the cloud streaming uh, solution. So that's uh, definitely going to help the end user. And then I'll go for uh, Knut and Christine Neckbaum, sorry, from uh, from uh, Fin Reality. Well, uh, for us, it's of course the, uh, the market is uh, mature yet. And um, there is also uh, a need of availability for hardware. So uh, we have to educate the market a lot. The customer doesn't know that the possibilities are there at the moment, and they doesn't know <laughs> how to use it. So it's a lot of education in the market. Yeah. So that's one of the biggest issues. Yeah, I think that the discrepancy in the market between the need for um, solutions that are available in every space, uh, especially browsers, browser available stuff, but they also want um, the visuals that they've seen in the latest video games. So. Uh, yeah, educating the, the market on what's actually possible for them, the required sums involved. I very much agree with, uh, with Knut and uh, Christina. Uh, the, the market, they, they, some, some, some people say that uh, the customer is always right, but they're not, they're always wrong. Uh, they usually come to us and ask us, uh, or they tell us, we want this, and we say, no, that's not what you want. Give us a goal, give us what you want to achieve, and we'll tell you how to get there. And usually they agree after a couple of hours, <laughs> but uh, th that is really a big problem. And the other one is kind of connected to it. What we experience is people are always looking for 
uh, research on this, but uh, the sympathetic uh, reaction uh, of the central nervous system is the same uh, from a VR experience, from a bear chasing you, from being late to work, from watching football. And that's been proven 50 years ago. Uh, so people chasing this, we need more science to prove this. I disagree with them. Uh, it has been proven and there's really not a lot to discuss. This works. So it's, it's how we communicate. This is what I tell my people. It's how we communicate and what we tell people. As you're smiling. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I have a feeling that maybe 3DL might have uh, some of the same issues. Uh, Sham? It's uh, market maturity as uh, it correctly mentioned. And uh, in addition, for in our target market, it is the resistance from teachers to try something new. And that comes from the fact that the kids are much smarter than the teachers when it comes to using digital technology, right? They are digital natives. So the teacher doesn't want to look like a fool. So we have to first spend time training the teachers before they take it on. So, but over time it will take, but it's going to be a long journey to come over the early innovator and bridge the gap to make it mainstream. And uh, things take time, as they say in Norway, Keith. <laughs> 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 um, I'm, but I'm seeing the, the, the trend here is awareness seems to be one of the, the biggest issues and hardware for you Vixel but that's understandable if you want to get because um, I'm assuming a lot of people probably want to have it on the Oculus Quest or something that's standalone because the ease of use is much easier than connecting it to a big computer but then you also have the problem with, with graphics uh, but I, I see that I know that you Runa, you're working on, on, on uh, I mean, cloud computing. Uh, and, and it's going to be fascinating to see the future of that cloud computing. So I'm going to go, first I'm going to go for Christopher, and then I'm going to go for Joe, Adrian. Yeah, I have to say the maturity of the, uh, of the cloud as well. Uh, I think uh, for us, uh, speaking to 50 plus uh, people that has been in the industry for a long time. I think it's uh, it's hard for them to to really understand the value of this because everything just works how they do it now in the traditional way, right? So so it's really about communicating the value of this and making them understand that this can actually benefit their everyday uh, training uh, and and uh, yeah, just just understand the. Um, the importance of of uh, having this development in their industry as well that's good uh, joe yeah so um i guess uh, i agree with everybody but um, especially in the museum sector the the big question is money so uh, <laughs> they have to apply for uh doing projects like uh, like these in the scale that i've shown shown today it, it takes a couple of years or if you're lucky uh, to get the funding to do something like that. And, um, uh, but uh, uh, just in the last year, we've seen that uh, when, uh, when I spoke to museum clients uh, just one and a half years ago, they were like very, not very um, approachable, but now everybody wants uh, digital solutions. They want to disseminate across uh, digital um, technology. Um, so mostly now it's like, okay, making the right project, we have to help them uh, make the right project and then help them to apply uh, the right funding uh, to uh, be able to make the, the projects that are interesting and, and are moving the, the, what do you call the medium forward. And, and you also had to bake in the, uh, I mean, to get funding for this project, you had to kind of pitch that, okay, but we have to do this to preserve the 3D models in case something catastrophic happens. You, you, you didn't just go like, hey, we're going to make a cool VR experience for people to see. You, you needed something else connected to, to this to get funding, right? Yeah, so this particular project was, they were like really forward thinking uh, at the Fuller Museum. So um, they had actually thought out the project, but the way that they could get funding, the most of the funding was for conservation. Uh, but uh, what we tell all 
all our clients in the museum sector. And what we try to hammer in is that uh, there's no point in conserving if you don't uh, uh, tell stories. Uh, so you need to uh, you need to figure out what story to tell to use this content to actually uh, engage the audience. Otherwise, it's just sitting there on the server. Uh, so that's the main point. I have. Um, Joe? Yeah, yeah um, I think we, we need to uh, wrap it up now. Uh, unfortunately, we're just getting into the, the Q&A and a lot of interesting discussions. This is always how it goes, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, if, if you you would like to say some last words, Keith, and then I can I can just do the uh, announcements and then we can um, we can wrap up. Yeah, okay, okay. I just have just have have some some some, some super last words just about the, the themes we we're talking about. Um, you know, I used to work before VR. I used to work uh, with videos, and uh, I remember uh, there was a time where just pitching videos to to clients was hard. Like not every client thought, okay, yeah, we need a video for our business to kind of show what's going on. And video has been there for like a hundred years, but now it's become very normal because Facebook uh, supports videos. The internet has gone faster. So it's way more normal to use it. But before this wasn't normal, uh, not that normal. And this wasn't, wasn't too long ago. Now we're looking at virtual reality, which is actually pretty new. This VR is new. Well, it's a completely new medium. but And of course, there's a lot of awareness that has to be uh, worked on to to get people to to use it, but at the same time, VR hasn't been there for that, that long. So I I know there's more work to do, but it's still impressive to see how much you guys have been able to do and what your clients are actually how they're using virtual reality. Uh, and I think you know uh, we're going in such a fast space with with hardware right now that cloud computing is going to be a thing where you can use standalone headsets and have uh, high VR fidelity. Um, so it's going to be very exciting to see what's going on. And I got to say, great, great cases. Uh, very happy, uh, Joe, for for uh, for you, you know, coming up and saying, hey, I wish you do an AWE event, seeing what's going on in Norway. And I actually did have a question for Joe, but but I know we're going to wrap up. I was just wondering how the the how is the awareness in, in Finland and like uh, the market maturity compared to Norway? Uh, if you had some, something to say about that, but we can we can we can talk about it later and and just wrap things up. I, I could just quickly say that you know everything. Everything that I've heard right now is pretty much on par with what's going on in Finland. It's it's just we need to educate the market, and that's the number one thing before we can really, you know, before before uh, companies can know that that this technology can help them meet their business goals. All I mean, like all across the board, from marketing to operations to you name it, training, what have you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, I, I'll I'll just say thank you, Keith. You're a great co-host. Um, thank you for all the participants that came. Thank you for all the attendees and everybody watching at home. I'm just going to quickly um, uh, share share my screen um, to to show the, the last bit of slides and announcements, and then uh, here we go. So uh, for AWE night, uh, of course. The Augie Awards are coming up as part of All USA, AWU USA joined us. Hopefully I can be there in California, November 9 to 11, 2021. It's gonna be live and in person. That's gonna be fantastic. Um, follow us on social media. We have our hashtags, hashtag All Night Northern XR. There's of course, hashtag All Night and All Academy. And these are some of the, the really cool um, courses that you can see and you can take part in for our academy, the XR virtual collaboration workshop, uh, all night uh, XR startup showcase, all night XR streaming, uh, and then the web AR workshop. And last but not least, join us uh, in September, September 16th, AR on location, all night Northern XR. There's like a, a world tour for the, uh, the location based AR, and we're gonna have Google. We're going to have Niantic and Immersal. We're going to be part of All Night Northern XR. So enjoy your summer, but we'll see you again in September. And you'll catch the recording on YouTube and we'll post it all over the place. Thank you very much for everybody for joining us. Have a great evening and a great summer. <laughs>